and um, really looking forward to all of you being on the call today. It was a very interactive section, session, I would say, and today we hope for exactly the same. We're going to go over a lot of things. The objectives here, I'm not just going to read through them for you. You can always read them on yourself, read them yourselves, but we're going to really go over mostly the blood spot. We're going to be going over how you communicate with the Ohio Department of Health. We're going to go over a little bit of the hearing screening. We're going to go over the cardiac screening uh, with Dr. Gupta Basare. We're going to do a lot on the talking about the new Duchenne muscular dystrophy screening, which is a quite exciting thing. Ohio really leading the, the charge on this one nationally. Um, so we got a lot to cover. And with no further ado, we're going to jump right in. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Gupta Basare, who's going to be able to tell us about um, Con critical congenital heart disease and screening and uh, the issues around that. So Rocky, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Dr. Bowling. Um, so hopefully this is a refresher for many of you, but for sure, if there's questions that have been on your mind, definitely, you know, we invite you to drop them in the chat box and I'll be sure to answer them. Uh, but the newborn heart screen was actually first recommended by the AAP in 2011. It was designed to detect critical congenital heart defects. Um, so it doesn't pick up on every congenital heart defect. So something like a VSD or a ventricular septal defect, that would not be considered critical. The critical ones are those that have been um, determined to need intervention or surgery in the first year of life. So it was then in 2014 that Ohio adopted this universally for all newborns born in our state. Um, the results get reported to the state level. Um, and fortunately, we do have a 99.9% pass rate. Although it should be known that the sensitivity of the screen is between 50 and 76%. What that means is 25 to 50% of newborns with a critical heart defect will not get detected by this screen. So some heart defects don't present with low oxygen saturation levels. Despite that, this screen has been shown to decrease mortality due to critical heart defects by more than 30%. So it is still a very valuable screen to be done. In addition, it has the ability to pick up on other non-cardiac heart defects that might present with a low-ish oxygen level. So something like persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. So ideally it is done on newborns in a nursery setting who are on room air um, at or after 24 hours of life. Life. It can be done earlier if a family is being discharged before then, and it can be done afterwards if a, if a newborn um, was delivered at home or not in a hospital setting. It is done by checking an oxygen level on the right hand, which is a preductal site, and one of the feet, which is a postductal site. So it's true that either site can be checked. It doesn't have to be both, but the AAP is really encouraging providers to check both. Um, a baby will pass if the oxygen saturation is 95% or higher. And if the difference between the two locations is 3% or less. So I'll often point out to my students, if we have an oxygen saturation of 96% on the hand and 100% on the feet, while those two values are great, that difference is 4%. So that baby would not pass with those values because it's more than 3% of a difference. So if a baby does not pass the screen, the recommendation is to repeat the screen retest in one hour. And if at that point, the baby again does not pass, you do have the option to proceed with getting an echo and calling it a fail. Um, you also have the option to do a third screening test, again, one hour later. And if at that point, the baby does not pass, you would again, proceed with getting an echo. Now, it would be an automatic fail and there would be no rescreening if an oxygen saturation in either hand or foot were less than 90%. Um, there's a QR code here to the Ohio algorithm on screening, um, which is quite nicely laid out if um, you wanted a, a resource.
Thanks very much, Rocky. That was very helpful. We're going to talk very briefly here about uh, newborn screening as well. Um, newborn screening um, is mandated by the Ohio Revised Code and is implemented by the Ohio Administrative Code. For those that are a little bit of a refresher who need from your from your government classes, the Revised Code is what the legislature um, passes, and then the Administrative Code is what the Ohio Department of Health, um, under direction from the state legislature, implements. The religious exemption remains in place for this as it does for um, heart screening and for newborn screening. Um, it is mandated at birth hospitals. Um, there's no specification as to type or brand of hearing screening that is done. Um, and then there is a referral to audiology made at that point. One of the important things to remember, and we'll go over this a little bit um, when, in one of our case studies, um, is about CMV screening, which should be routinely done for our kids who fail, um, or, uh, repeatedly fail after a screening to audiology. Um, Follow-up with ENT is a critical piece of newborn hearing screening, and it's a kind of incumbent on um, all of us as providers of newborn care to know what our ENT referral patterns can and should be. It's also, an, a, our role is to arrange services um, as we're able to do. Um, obviously can't do absolutely everything, but um, our patients really depend on us to know where to go for appropriate referral. Um, office policies, as they are with all screening procedures, are really critical. Um, and so a lot of what we find at, at, the America, at the Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics is, you know, one of our roles is support of uh, primary care offices. These are really, really important pieces. And those of you who are allied health professionals can be an incredible resource for our uh, pediatric health care providers in helping sort of smooth this out for families on where they need to go. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Leslie, who is going to talk with us about um, the biggest chunk of today's discussion, which is around the newborn blood spot. So with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. Leslie. Uh, good afternoon. Happy Pi Day for all the, the views who recognize that. Um, and um, we're going to start, as most newborn screening talks start, with the original Wil uh, Wilson and Younger newborn screening criteria. These have been around for decades, uh, and they still constitute most of the backbone of why we screen and why we include what we do. Um, so, um, so we start with the, the condition that we're screening should matter. We shouldn't be screening for things like, um, do you have a gene that makes you not like cilantro? Um, which you'll recognize as something that you might find on, um, 23andMe. Uh, there should be an accepted treatment for patients with a recognized condition. So we shouldn't be screening just to provide information. There should be something specific we're going to do about it. Um, there should be facilities for diagnosis and treatment. So that's actually important and it may uh, account for some of the discrepancies we see in some of the developing world because uh, if you don't have a way to provide, for example, uh, nutrition uh, formula and monitoring for PKU, screening for PKU is not going to be as, as helpful. It may be critical, but it's not helpful as it would be in uh, in something like the United States, where that is an expectation for all areas in all states. Um, there should be a recognizable latent or, asympt or early symptomatic phase. It, it might not be asymptomatic, but it should be so not very recognizable that the uh, the average provider would not be able to sort this out from something else. This is probably best uh, uh, exemplified by galactosemia, which doesn't appear until usually three to eight days of age. But, you know, the, the early symptoms are jaundice and not eating very well, which um, every pediatrician and, and many, many uh, allied health providers will realize is not very specific. You wouldn't say, oh, ha ha, I know what you have. Um, there should be a suitable test. We can't we can't test unless we have 
a test. Uh, as you've already heard, uh, some of our tests are not on a dried blood spot. Hearing is not. Uh, congenital heart disease is not. But they are also considered within this framework. They have a test. Um, the test should be acceptable to the population. We should not be testing for things that the population says we shouldn't be doing. Um, the natural history should be understood. This one actually always makes me laugh because, uh, you know, we're still learning what the natural history of some of these things is. Uh, even 30, 40, you know, more than 50 years when we're talking about PKU. Um, there should be an agreed upon policy on whom to treat. That one is also one that gives me a little bit of a giggle because I think as we uh, look at data, we realize that no matter what we do, what we think we know when we start a screening program is usually not what we actually are scratching our heads about a year later. Um, here's our cost benefit ratio. We should at least not uh, many of the conditions that are on the current newborn screen cost a lot to treat. Um, uh, on the other hand, the amount of morbidity that we might save um, is uh, can be in the millions of dollars, for example, SMA. Uh, and there should be ongoing learning regarding case finding. And that one I would like to highlight you know, put balloons on and everything else, because if we don't pay attention to the data that's incoming, uh, we will continue to be in the dark. So um, there has been an effort to standardize uh, newborn screening across the United States. So a baby who is born in Youngstown should not be having a screen that's substantially different than somebody who is born in Pittsburgh. Um, However, uh, this is only advisory, uh, and all states are have a lot of, um, we're a federation, uh, states, states have their own rules as to what is actually uh, done. But there is now what's called the Advisory Com Committee on Heritable Disorders of uh, Newborns. This has had several different uh, versions of that name, but they all serve about the same purpose. And it advises the secretary of HHS on the most appropriate application of newborn screening tests, technologies, policies, guidelines, and standards. So their process is very similar to the original Wilson and Youngers with, with some technical changes. Uh, and they have just actually revised what their their marching orders are. Uh, they are to consider, is the condition serious? That goes along with it should matter. Uh, can a case be defined? In other words, can we actually find one using our technology? And this has actually been one of the barriers to implementation that they actually require that somebody be able to use newborn screening technology uh, to find a real case. Um, we should know that the tests that we're doing have analytical validity. In other words, we should be able to measure what we are saying we're going to measure and tell the difference between abnormal and normal. Uh, there should be clinical utility. That's the, is there something we can do about it? Uh, are treatments available again? Uh, and is there prospective data to support the process through population screening? That's what I said. Somebody's got to be able to find one before we make a recommendation. Next. So the ACTONC comes up with a, a list that's called the RUSP, or the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel. And once again, it's aspirational, but it, most states at some point are going to try to evaluate everything that has been put on the RUSP and decide where, when, and how they are going to adopt it. Um, so the ultimate goal is predictable and uniform set of conditions in all states. Uh, the initial recommended uh, uniform screening panel was actually done around 1990. Uh, it was uh, done in a very different way. It was done by a stakeholder survey, which was commissioned by the American College of Medical Genetics. And it was highly focused on the evolving mass spec technology that was just emerging as, as, as the new way to do newborn screening for a lot of small molecule conditions. Um, they sent surveys out to a whole bunch of people, uh, myself included. I filled it out. Um, they didn't there was a lot of criticism of the process, um, whether or not they actually got expert opinions. Um, 
they didn't tell me I couldn't fill out the endocrine ones, but I did. Um, by the way, I still consider myself okay to do that, but uh, uh, and it doesn't fit our current model of evidence-based decision making. Uh, so the new process includes nomination, which can come from anybody, and it often comes from uh, parent support groups. Uh, evidence review, and how words, they look. Is the disease, is there a test? Is this disease important? Do we have a treatment? The pragmatic capabilities that the states have of being able to adopt something. Um, and then finally, once they've made a recommendation, it gets signed off or not by the secretary of uh, HHS. So what's included in the RUSP? Well, the tests that are done on the dried blood spot, which is the greatest number of things, plus the point of care tests, which are hearing screening and pulse ox testing for critical congenital heart disease. So just in um, sort of a context, um, this is the dried blood spot screening data from 2022 in Ohio. We screened uh, about 120,000 specimens. Uh, there were about 1,600 that were screens that were repeated for a variety of reasons. Uh, a lot of those were done as a repeat because uh, the baby was a preemie. The initial one was done before 24 hours for very good reasons, and then another one was sent. There were 190 that were rejected as unsatisfactory. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons to reject something as unsatisfactory, but the most common reason is there's not enough blood. Um, we don't get very many where somebody, you know, spilled their Coke on it. Um, or maybe it got lost in the mail and it arrived three three weeks later. But Ohio ha actually has a career um, service that avoids most of that. I'm using the word flag or alert as saying something that is does not pass as low risk or normal. Uh, and there were about 3,300 of those in 2022. And that excludes hemoglobin trait, which is um, treated uh, as a separate issue because uh, almost everybody uh, identified as having trait on a newborn screen does have trait. Um, there were 129 confirmed cases of something. And there were 362 other uh, carriers or conditions. Most of those are going to be carriers. Um, a very big bulk of that are uh, carriers for cystic fibrosis. Um, and here's where the, the pro um, provider offices can help a lot in that, you know, at the end of 22, 2022, we still had 1,700 cases where the feedback hadn't come in uh, and they were unable to close the cases. And, and ODH is well aware that what we are asking providers to do is very difficult in this world of uh, electronic medical records. It was one thing when everything was paper and when you got the results back, you just sort of you know stuck it in a fax machine, what's that? Um, these days, a lot of our tests are complex. You might wind up with a report that you know, a genetic testing report that's several pages long that you have to download out of, out of Epic, try and print it. I'm not very good at that. And then send off. Um, so, you know, working on that, trying to make it easier. So what happens? This is the process. What happens when a newborn screen or a dried blood spot gets flagged? This is different from the point of care ones where you know before the baby goes home that you have something that needs uh, follow-up. So the state will call and fax a report to the PCP of record. That's whoever is identified in the birth hospital um, as, um, as who you are. State's not allowed to call families directly. So if you get one of these and you never heard of the baby, they may ask you to call the family and ask them <laughs> what doctor they're actually seeing. Um, often another designated entity. Uh, so for example, my own uh, Cincinnati Genetic Center gets a copy of that and that lands on our fax machine. That doesn't get called usually unless uh, something is super critical. We do have a process for super critical values. So for example, if, the, if something very, very abnormal shows up on a Saturday morning, uh, the technician or the supervisor in the newborn screening lab has to try and track down somebody on a Saturday afternoon, um, which as you can imagine, um, has its own issues. Um, 
but it can be life-saving. Um, this is not for just anything. The, these have been carefully selected and vetted. So following and flag newborn screening may result in a baby needing a repeat screen, uh, diagnostic labs, an urgent visit, and sometimes an emergency referral, depending on what we have. The expectation is the family will be counseled as to what this is, why are we calling them? Um, what we're worried about, uh, what we found, um, and uh, develop a plan. And then finally, in order to do that final thing, that Wilson and Younger things, which is we need feedback. We need to continuously iterate and, and fix the problems in our system, closing the loop back. So... A lot of things that we do on the dried blood spot screening is genetic, but most of the testing we're doing is not on DNA. Uh, and that's a common misconception. Um, so currently the only testing where molecular testing is the primary test is SCID and SMA. And both of those, we're not doing sequencing. We're actually looking for something that is missing. Um, so they're done by what's called qPCR. Um, so in some other states, including New York, which has been a real um, pioneer in this, uh, they do what's called secondary, second tier testing with sequencing or another biochemical marker on the original dried blood spot before they ever pick up the phone. Uh, and that's not, not currently being done in Ohio, but it's certainly being uh, contemplated um, how best to do it and uh, in you know, pragmatics basically. Uh, so there are no sequencing first disorders, uh, and there are some things that it would require that we have sequencing first in order to find them. Um, but there are research efforts to see if we can um, define some of those. We do do um, second tier in lab testing for cystic fibrosis. There's a panel for 39 common pathogenic variants that are performed if the primary marker, which is IRT, is uh, above a certain cutoff. And so if you see a lot of babies, you will see that um, the most common abnormal for CF is the IRT was elevated and we found one variant and please go get a sweat. Um, Nancy, and, um, let me inter interrupt you for just a yeah, second. Yeah, absolutely. Since we have a, a broad variety of people here, could you explain briefly for us about the difference between sequencing and uh, just explain that just a little bit for our audience? Oh, absolutely. Sorry, I'm a geneticist, so this sort of is always... So, uh, although I explain this to families all the time, so I'm going to use my family first uh, language here. Um, sequencing is where we're looking for the spelling changes in those... A's and G's and C's and T's that 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 make the the bulk. It would be like doing a spell check, okay? Um, there are lots of other genetic testing where we're looking for something that might be is is the entire book missing from the library rather than is there a typo on page five? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So, you know, the sequencing you know, is that DNA sequencing for folks. So they just to just to reiterate for them. But yes, that I think that's a good way of describing it. And if people have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat box for us. OK, we'll go on to the next. So what's relatively new? I mean, everybody knows that PKU has been on the screen for more than 50 years, and it was the original. Uh, in fact, some people call the whole newborn screen the PKU test. I would encourage you not to, uh, because it is much more than that. Um, so uh, Crab A disease um, was initiated uh, by legislative uh mandate basically in Ohio. Uh, Kentucky was at about a similar place. And uh, that was just reconsidered by uh, the Secretary's Advisory Council. So it's not quite on the rusp yet, but it will probably get a favorable thumbs up um, in a more limited version than uh, what uh, we have been doing. Crab A is a devastating neurologic disorder. Uh, mucopolysaccharidosis 1, some people remember that as being Hurler disease. It's a storage disorder. Uh, it 
it creeps up on you very, very slowly, uh, and it's treatable with either an enzyme infusion or a bone marrow transplant. We started screening for that about the same time as Crebe uh, in 2017. And Pompe disease is a form of muscular dystrophy that is also uh, um, treated with enzyme. Uh, and we started screening for that in 2017. Those were actually all packaged in the same, uh, the same assay in the lab. Um, so uh, the two most common and uh, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, Ohio was actually in what we call the validation phase where we were testing most babies, even though it was not on our official menu. Um, and that was officially launched in 2022. That's a very important condition uh, because there is very effective therapy that is most effective if initiated in the first couple weeks of life. Um, and, and most babies these days are getting referred for gene therapy, um, which is sort of cool. Um, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy is, is making us busy. Um, so this is a condition that, uh, that can show up in boys. They show up with ADHD and change in schoolwork. And it, by the time you see those kinds of things, they've got an ongoing process that is too late to treat. So the idea is to identify them in the newborn period and put them through a rather, I have to say, um, grueling protocol where they get MRIs of their brain every six months for the first 10 years of life. Um, and we're seeing a lot of those and we're, you know, starting to identify carrier girls, which wasn't the goal, but anyway. Um, our newest, and we're gonna call, talk about this a, a little bit, uh, is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And that is, Ohio will be the first state to do this statewide, and it is not yet on the RUSP. Uh, MPS2 or Hunter disease happens in boys. It looks like hurler, but it's not. Uh, and then GAMPT is a very rare creatine synthesis disorder that's actually hard to diagnose. And those, the lab will be working on adding those uh, soon. They're not live yet. All right, somebody else takes thyroid. So this is me. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Nancy. That was great. And really, um, we have a great panel. I just want to remind everybody, Dr. Leslie, Dr. Gupta Basare, um, uh, uh, we're, um, uh, Anna's also on here from Cleveland. So we have a really, Dr. Mitchell's on here. Um, and then um, they're going to be able to answer questions for you. So if you have questions for Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Gupta Basare, Dr. Leslie, please, please, please use them in your chat box there. Um, just a brief word on thyroid screening. It is mandated as the other ones. We uh, do not have an endocrinologist on today's call, um, but we can give you a little bit of data on this. Um, repeat and follow up as frequently as needed. Um, certainly this is the, is the goal here. It's a TSH, which has a high um, uh, rate of giving you false positives, um, but um, again, requires a lot of uh, referral to endocrinology for those positive screens. Um, as with hearing, robust in-office tracking is needed due to the high false positive and frequent repeats. Just to say that again, it's really the office policies that are the big piece to thyroid screening. So how, again, how does the Ohio address newborn screening? Um, this is the Ohio revised code for the newborn blood spot. Um, it, again, I sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier that it's all kids should be screened for genetic, endocrine, and metabolic disorders, as well as con critical congenital heart disease and hearing screening. These, these revised codes do not apply if there is a religious exemption. Um, and there still is some uh, uncertain, there still is a, a, an ability to opt out on Crab A disease. As Dr. Leslie mentioned, um, it's one that has a very um, uh, difficult prognosis. Um, and some people will elect not to get that, not very often though. Um, the, the, after that is done, after um, the Ohio uh, revised code, which is legislative stuff, it is then turned over to the advisory panel of 14 members that are selected by and report to the director of the Ohio Department of Health. Um, and again, using those criteria, like Dr. Leslie mentioned, what the expected benefits are to kids, is there something that you can screen for effectively 
is it something that will be accepted and can be sustained um, by the medical community? Um, again, it's the same, some very similar patterns for congenital heart disease and hearing screening. It's not important to know what those revised code numbers are. You can look them up if you ever have to need to know them. So let's dive into these case uh, discussions. I'm re really gonna be leaning on Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Leslie, and Dr. Gupta Basare as we go through these. And Mark, I'll have you go ahead and interrupt me whenever we have uh, questions that pop up in our chat, bo chat box. So num case number one, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Baby Lee is a 30 week old preterm newborn male delivered at Metro General in Cleveland. He has an inconclusive DMD screening reported from his newborn blood spot, an inconclusive screen for muscular dystrophy. So what's next? I'm gonna turn this over to our panel. What do you, um, uh, how does this play out for us? What are we looking for? What do you, how do you anticipate as this new screening comes online? What are you expecting us to see how this is going to play out for providers? Chris, you want me to take that one? Love that. That would be great. Okay. So Duchenne is probably one of the most common things that we would potentially be able to identify in newborn screening. Uh, and the marker is basically CPK, which is something that is not so hard to measure. And the newborn blood spot, I think we're doing uh, MMCPK. Uh, the problem with Duchenne is twofold. One is babies get squished when they get pushed through the birth canal. So their CPKs at 24 hours of age are higher than they will be at two weeks of age. If we, in the perfect world, we would not screen anybody for Duchenne until two weeks of age, but we don't have a system would, that copes with that. So the way these will be reported back for babies over 2000 grams, uh, in Ohio is that if the CPK is above a certain amount, we're going to send this back to you as inconclusive. In other words, it's above the flag. We can't tell if it's normal or abnormal. We expect that there will probably be at least 2,000 of these statewide every year. And the reason it's called inconclusive is to hopefully uh, not have a whole bunch of Google docking of Duchenne, which could be very disturbing. Um, and then the recommendation is to either send back another dried blood spot, or if it's easier from your office, you can actually send a CK to a diagnostic lab, uh, as long as you send back the feedback <laughs> to the state. Um, and uh, different offices are going to do different things, uh, depending on their avail availability of drawing a, a repeat blood card in the office or, or um, close by. Um, for babies under 2,000 grams, the problem here is not false positives. The problem here is false negatives because there were a few babies, very small babies in the New York pilot that were false negative. And it was suspected that's because little babies don't have very much muscle, so they don't make a whole lot of CK. Uh, and so right now with no other data to go on is if the baby is under 2000 grams at the time of initial screening, it doesn't matter if it's normal, uh, they're going to be asked to do a repeat at over 2000 grams and two weeks of age. Um, that's gonna be actually more than the term baby ones. Um, and hopefully we will get data back that says we can you know, ratchet that down to 1800 grams or something that's a little more practical since we do send babies home at 1800 grams. Um, but I think this is going to be challenging because there are going to be a lot of uh, reliance on the on the primary offices to try and handle these and to to get the data back. On the other hand, you don't have to order anything that's particularly fancy. Um, almost every diagnostic lab can do a CPK and some some can actually do it on a heel stick sample. That's a really, you know, I, I kind of missed that in our last thing, you know, like really that how easily that's going to be to do that in your primary lab. Um, that, that's a huge um, assist for offices. You're right. The, the big challenge, it looks like it's going to be, is going to be the um, trying to sort out those false negatives and false positives. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, did you have any thoughts on this also? No, just so I think we're all sort of interested just to see what happens when this actually goes live. Um, so I know we've had concerns of how many babies are going to get flagged 
uh, just because of being born tends to elevate the CK? And then are how much how many challenges are we going to have in getting those repeat samples at two weeks so that we can close the cases? So we definitely want primary care providers being aware of the process and, and helping collect the, any of those samples at the two weeks that we need or to, to get those follow-ups. And I'd like to put a shout out as we have a genetic counseling student, Paige Oaklawn, who actually I think is on this uh, thing. Uh, her thesis project is going to be to try and um, ask you guys, how did it work? What can we do better? So if you get an email or fax or query from anybody asking for feedback, this is legit. Uh, she's not a scammer. And we really do want to know how it's working and so we, how we can fix it. And this is really, you know, this is, we love this project uh, jointly between Ohio AP and ODH. We really, we, yeah, like you say, this is a work in progress. You both have said this is a work in progress. And we really want to know how Ohio AP and ODH can help with this. So please be communicating back to us as we move along through this process. As you kind of remember, this uh, 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 PHP program that, the, that these talks are part of is also, it's got an improve, improvement phase that's going to go into effect next year. Um, so we're constantly looking ways. This is this is an area that we're very interested in and looking for people's input on this one. Case two, uh, CMV. Um, I'm going to have Dr. Gupta Basaray be ready to help us with this one as well today. Um, our neonatologists know this one very well. Uh, baby Carson is a female infant with a low birth weight uh, born at 38 weeks uh, in Zanesville. She failed her newborn hearing screening in the hospital twice. Um, at this point, um, uh, some things to know about CMV testing. We can do saliva and urine testing in the first 21 days after birth. Um, probably should be done on this child. CMV kids with CMV can also develop late onset hearing loss, so stay vigilant. They may pass early and then have problems later, so CMV is a real issue. Um, diagnostic hearing evaluations should be done for all who do not pass this newborn hearing screening. It should be part of your routine to check for CMV um, uh, if there if the you know turns out to be a, a real positive. Um, the first year of life, as we know, is critical for language and communication development. So it's important to act fast. It's important to follow up on those on those positive screenings. Um, diagnostic hearing and screening evaluations can be done by the pediatric audiologist um, uh, by three months of age. Um, can be very useful. Um, so with that, I was going to turn over uh, Rocky. Did you have, uh, you had some thoughts the last time? Someone asked us about testing between uh, CM, on, between saliva and urine testing on CMV. Um, could you get some insight that you can share with um, us on that? Absolutely. So CMV is very ubiquitous. The majority of adults have been exposed to CMV, and it and um, and it's easily communicated through body fluids, tears, urine, saliva, um, and if acquired postnatally, it's not that big of a deal at all. But if it's acquired during pregnancy to a fetus and then a newborn, it can be devastating, with specifically with regards to hearing loss. So that's why that distinction of postnatal versus prenatal um, exposure is important. And so testing within that first three weeks or 21 days, if it's positive, then it's most likely due to prenatal exposure. Um, and because we were saying CMV is ubiquitous and tr transferred in body fluids, it is also transferred in breast milk. So if a baby is breastfeeding, um, then, and we had a saliva sample from them just for logistical purposes, we weren't able to collect urine or they didn't pee on demand as no babies will. Um, and so we have a saliva sample. We need to confirm that positive saliva sample with a positive urine sample um, just to have confidence that it was indeed prenatally um, acquired and not postnatally. So uh, that's the distinction between the saliva and the urine and the postnatal versus prenatal um, exposure to CMV. Great. Thank you. 
Um, any questions from our participants? We've covered, a, we're covering a lot of ground here. So I know you got to have questions out there. So please feel free to chime in. So case three um, brings up some issues. Um, we wanted to talk a, a little bit about family considerations and ethical uh, situations. There's a, we may not think about this being a big ethical zone, but when we went through those Wilson Youngner um, criterion, a lot of that really, it kind of dances around the idea that there's a lot of ethics playing out around newborn screening. And so we thought it would be important to talk about a case that might have some ethical considerations around it. And I'm gonna lean on Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Leslie as we go into this one. Um, this is case three. A new mother in your practice informs you that her family recently moved from Dayton to Dayton from California. They have a newborn and the clinic there told her something along the lines like, the baby screening is fine, but you should be concerned about ALD for future pregnancies when you get settled in Ohio. She did not remember the name adrenoleukodystrophy being used. However, she did remember ALD. So anything in particular we need to know about ALD? Um, what is our role as a pediatric provider? And what are the challenges when you have information like this? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, so anything in particular we need to know about ALD? Dr. Mitchell, can you start us off? Yeah. So. Um... I think one of the, the things with this ALD, it's um, an X-linked disorder, which means the genes on the X chromosome, so it's more likely boys who are going to be affected. Um, although we uh, have been founding, at least uh, our genetics clinic here, uh, after this test went live in Ohio, the first five or six babies who were flagged to us were all girls, um, and some of them then turned out to be carriers for the disorder. So this turned out to be a whole it's not the reason the screen was set up. Um, and we were a little bit, um, I had to kind of scramble to figure out what we were doing with these baby girls who were being come in because now you're finding lots of implications to family members when you're identifying an X-linked condition in the family. Um, and again, not at all the reason that this test was set up. It was really to identify boys who would be affected with the disorder and, and get treatment for them. And so um, that kind of, Took us by surprise in a way and we had to think that through. Um, I think in this particular case it'd be very important to get those records from California. Um, also is the baby who you have, is it a boy or a girl? Um, in terms of the likelihood that the patient could really have disease. Um, and then you know given it's been a while it'd be really important to get the child seen somewhere so we could have confirmatory testing, whatever follow-ups needed to determine is this real? Um, or is it a, a false screen? Again, some of that would depend on the, the gender of the baby in your practice. You know, it's interesting. I, I think, you know, the one that we also see a lot of as pediatricians in this same zone, and, and Dr. Leslie, you mentioned this a bit, is we it seemed like we would get a lot of kids too that would have, um, you know, another one where you, we would uncovering carrier status was CF. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it's like, I think it's important, you know, you're bringing this up. It's really important to remember that a lot, there's a lot of unintended consequences with um, newborn screening. And that's not a failure of the system. It's just it, medicine is complicated and we need to figure out how to handle some of these things. Yeah. Um, but I think there's, you know, in Jake's, we're always saying that things we talk, we're often not just dealing with the patient, but the family. Right. Because all of these genetic things, you know, if the child's a carrier, it's highly likely a parent was a carrier. And so you really are learning information about multiple family members and, and need to be prepared to discuss or share share that. Yeah. I mean, it just, I mean, it has all sorts of implications for family mm -hmm. planning, et cetera. It's really, yeah, just it, it, an amazing um, amount of knowledge. Dr. Leslie, did you have any uh, contribution on this one too? Uh, yeah, actually, I think, um, remember my slide about what, what we find, uh, we do find cures. It's not the mission statement, though. And so I think it's important to realize that, you know, somebody might have one child, a parent might be a carrier for, let's say, CF, one of their children screened 
positive IRT, one variant, that variant is found in one child. The other children might have been okay on the newborn screen, but still be a carrier because our cutoffs are not meant to find those. Uh, the same is going to be true for ALD. Our cutoffs are not meant to find all of them. It's a possibility, not a promise. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we have the same problem with galactosemia. We have the same problem with MCAD. Not very often with PKU, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's not what we're looking for, and you can't rule out a carrier status based on a negative newborn screen, but you can certainly sometimes find it. That's a really good point. Yeah, that it's not, it's it's sort of an, it truly is an incidental finding. It's not what it's set up to screen for. Case four, resolving cases with ODH. So Landon Childers is a six-month-old male infant in your practice from Ironton. He is in the care of his father with significant help from his maternal grandmother because his mother passed away in a car accident when he was two months old. He had a positive blood spot for Crabbe disease, but you had not seen him since that report came back at one week. So six-month-old, very serious diagnosis on this, but now, um, uh, you know, kind of lost to follow up. So what's the best course of action at this point? Um, and what role can ODH and Ohio AP play? Um, what are some ways to help prevent incidents like this? So I'm going to turn it over to our panel, but I also would love to hear from our participants um, about strategies that you guys have used to avoid cases like this. Any thoughts from our panel? Um, just say it would, it would be nice to get get some of the follow up testing so again it can be confirmed is this real or not um, and you know I'm a geneticist but we always are here as a resource for primary care offices you know if this patient did show up we'd encourage you um, if if you need help have questions to reach out to your genetic center that's nearby um, because we are familiar with what the follow-up testing needs to be done. We can typically, when these kinds of situations, the urgent newborn screens can get them in same day, next day, kind of as, as soon as we can get patients seen. Um, and so we just wanna make sure people are using us as resources. Um, again, if you have questions, you need help, anything related to newborn screen, please reach out to your uh, nearest genetic center um, to get help. Um, or get recommendations, guidance, whatever needed. But given this child's been lost for several months, it sure would be nice to get them in pretty quickly, get the follow-up done, and, and just sort out, again, is this real or is it a false positive? So, and I intentionally, we intentionally placed Landon in Ironton, the furthest spot you oh. could probably get from any genetic center. So would you feel that, um, so any of our genetic centers would would be respect would be responsive to, to people who are out in more rural parts of our absolutely and you know if we with some conditions we prefer patients come into our genetics link in person to be seen and examined but we also can work with primary care offices to say these are the tests that should be ordered you know, if you can get them to a lab near you you can get some of the testing started. Um, to make it easier for the family, um, we also now, um, since the pandemic, I've gotten really good with telehealth and virtual visits so that families don't necessarily need to travel to us. Um, we can chat with them, explain the condition, help coordinate testing through the PCP from closer to home for them. Um, and then things, conditions that turn out to be real, those kids were definitely going to want to get in for for actual in-person appointments, but we can help with initial sorting out of things uh, remotely just to make sure we're getting that information for the family. That's great. That is really a wonderful resource. And I'd like to say just for, um, I think um, <laughs> most of the things that came out of the pandemic were not wonderful, but some <laughs> of the things that did come out of the pandemic uh, that that I am thankful for is the burgeoning availability of tele telemedicine and the ability to do more DNA testing on a, on a cheek swab, um, yeah. which we're using a lot. But, you know, I have managed to um, 
be able to be a resource often the same day a newborn screening call gets made to the primary care docs so they're like so i can reach out to the family in their own home with grandma there they're not you know hauling the their newborn into the office and mom had a c-section and can't uh to be able to actually you know talk to them face to face um sometimes that day. And that's been hugely important um, to be support to, to the primary caregivers as well as the families. They'll eventually need to come in, sometimes urgently, uh, to get a, a diagnostic specimen. Uh, but it's a whole lot easier to do if you can actually reach out and make contact. Absolutely. So I'm going to go through a couple of final slides here just uh, to kind of bring things up, and then we'll turn this back over to Mark to, to bring us on home here. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Leslie took us off to is babiesfirsttest.org, an excellent website. Um, you can also get a copy um, by going to the ODH website um, to, to, to get an e-report. We didn't talk about this, but signing up on this is huge really helpful. It's really useful um, if you're, uh, it, it, you can help your uh, local offices, encouraging them to sign up on the uh, centralized website. Um, there are a lot of advocacy opportunities around this. Advisory councils in many states um, are, are looking for people, and certainly in Ohio, um, there are opportunities to help us understand how to make this do better. We really do want you to reach out to us and to, uh, to Ohio AP and to ODH um, with your challenges, ideas, et cetera. Um, uh, this was a, 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 a some of the things that ODH allows us to download. Um, uh, and there are other resources from Mayo Clinic and other places as well. Again, we love the be best overall website being babiesfirsttest.org. Great one to check out. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Mark, who will um, wrap us up for today. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bowling. And I first want to take the opportunity to thank the Ohio Department of Health for our partnership today. And then, of course, our panel, um, Dr. Gupta Basare, Dr. Chris Bowling, Dr. Anna Mitchell, and Dr. Leslie. Um, we had a great presentation again today, and I hope that you all took home some information that you can use in your line of work. Um, I'll just kind of mention quickly here that we do have a few more topics in our education series that finishes um, through the summer. Um, we'll have a presentation on updates to diabetes type 1 and type 2 um, coming in April. Um, and then a couple of mental health topics. So ADHD in the younger ages, focusing on ages like 3 to 6. Um, that'll be an interesting talk about kind of the difference in diagnosis between ADHD and some of the other um, diagnoses that you can have. And then we're really excited also about our presentation on anxiety in the tween age child and kind of some resources and help with um, that condition there. So um, we're excited about that. I think there may be another slide here about our spring meeting. Yeah. Um, so we have our spring meeting coming up on April 19th um, here near Columbus at the Dublin Integrated Education Center. Um, this is a free um, educational meeting. We have two topics that we'll be covering at the meeting. Um, that ADHD presentation will be held in person as well as in webinar format from the previous slide. And then um, one of the, our big new initiatives at the Ohio AAP is for um, lead testing and screening. And so we'll be talking about um, how you can kind of get more buy-in from your practice um, and the best way to do screening, testing, and treatment, treatment excuse me, of lead exposure in children. I'm not sure there may be one more slide. Oh, um, and many of you that are on the call, I've seen familiar names that have had the chance to order our um, lead board books, um, but these are still out. We still have um, lead board books available for order. These are another free resource, um, and you're able to order up to 120 of these um, sort of board books for children that give a good look for families on how they can mitigate um, lead poisoning and exposure in their home. So we're excited to offer those for free. You can use this QR code um, to be able to access the ordering page for that. I'll be sending out tomorrow an email about information about how to obtain your CME or MOC Part 2 credit from today's webinar, as well as this slide presentation so that you can access any of those links for registering for future um, or for ordering uh, the books there. 
But otherwise, I think that's all we have for today. And again, thank you to everybody for attending and presenting today. Um, we had another great webinar, and I hope that you all have a good end to your week.